Okay, we're live. Uh, hello, everybody. This is uh, Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of uh, Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, today we're going to do part three of our study of Adam and Eve. We're, we're looking at all of the Adam and Eve verses in the scriptures and discussing them. And it's, uh, we're going off on some tangents that we find very interesting. Because Brother Dean was with us the last couple of weeks, and he keeps on asking a lot of hard questions. So he's not here this time. <laughs> Maybe we won't have to answer too many hard questions unless Jackson d does that. But um, it, it's really interesting, all the things that we're being able to glean from these Adam and Eve verses. Um, if you haven't seen the first two episodes, they're available on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. Uh, Adam and Eve Part 1 and Part 2, go and watch those. But for now, let me just ask the panelists to introduce themselves. Uh, we'll start with Brother Bill. Yep, hello. Hello. Yep, I'm working. Yep, he speaks. Working. Yep, I'm the Panda Man Evangelist. And, uh, you know, you, as you can tell by my name, I, I evangelize whether it's actually on the streets or, or on here on YouTube, man. All right, thank you, Brother Bill. Uh, and I, I want to encourage anybody who's watching this, uh, whether it's live or later, uh, um, please support the panelists, sub subscribe to them. Uh, I'm, everyone uh, on this panel here, I'm sure that you would benefit from subscribing to their channel. We're going to go to Brother Jackson next. Go ahead. Uh, I, I'll go next. I think he's kind of absent right now, is he? He said he'll be right back. All right, go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, I don't think he's back yet. Um, yeah, I am Uncle Sam, also known as Thick Shays on YouTube. You can go to my channel, thickshays.com, I mean, uh, thick, oh yeah, thickshays.com or youtube.com slash thickshays. Uh, I believe that the, uh, you know, once a son, always a son. Likewise, once a son of God, always son of God. Um, the uh, I'll just share just one passage, um, John three fifteen to seventeen. That whosoever believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. I mean, we know about this passage a lot. We heard a lot. But, you know, bottom line is, it's true. So, believe on Christ and have everlasting life. God bless you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Brother Sam. Okay, uh, if Jackson is back, otherwise when he gets back, uh, we'll have him introduce himself then. Uh, I'll, I'll just tell the world a little bit about him. His channel is called Mecca Wing Zero, and his, uh, his name is Jackson. Uh, he uh, hasn't made a lot of videos, but the videos he, he's made are really quality, very good teaching. So I hope you'll subscribe to all these panelists. Now let's begin looking at this topic of Adam and Eve. We're going to pick up where, right where we left off last time, and right now we're on uh, Genesis 3. Uh, we're going to start with verse 5. Uh, well, let me just go with verse 4 so, you, so we, everybody can see the perspective of where we went off. And it says in verse 4, And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. And then uh, verse 5 says, For God doth know that the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. All right, let me ask uh, anybody. I think the best way to do this is uh, anybody who wants to speak, just unmute if you want to re respond to that verse. And whoever unmutes first can just begin talking. Yeah, yeah, that verse there, it says, God doth know that you should you know, eat their all that your eyes shall be open and you shall be as gods, no good and evil. It, it's significant, you know, the significant points are, is God small g, 
so they're not omnipotent, they're not, you know, got the power of God, they might have now knowledge of good and evil, but they are not God by any sense of the term, they are almighty. And it also brings to mind the verse, you know, in the Gospels where where Jesus describes the, 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 the Pharisees as, as gods, you know, not that they were God, but they had at that point, because they was legalistic, they had the power of life and death over people and made certain judgments and decisions, you know, that, that affected everybody, including themselves. And we can see by the fall, now that little God, small g, their decisions now are going to affect, you know, not only themselves, but the people surrounding them. So that, you know, that's what we can draw out of that passage straight away. I'll say that the, um, this is how Satan um, tamp, uh, so to say, tamp people. The, he uh, he mix lies with you know what seems to be true, and you know sometimes he sp speaks certain truth, but that doesn't mean that he's speaking the uh, complete truth, and that's one of the reasons why we have to watch out about certain things being said. Uh, for example. You know, he he says, "Ye shall not surely die." When God clearly said, "You shall surely die," so he lied right there. But he mixed in with certain truth towards the end, where he says, "Your eyes shall be open and shall be as gods, knowing good and evil." So. You shall be as gods in small g, as Brother Bill was saying. Not he's not talking about God, but what would represent the image of God, and and knowing good and evil. So he mixes with certain truth, and and just to make his lies. And this is why I say sometimes, you know, not a not a complete truth. Is actually worse than a lie, and I think that's one of the reasons why in 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 our courts even you know they make you swear that you will say all truth but nothing but the truth, whole truth. So just like in rat poisoning, if you you know mix in with just one percent of uh, poison, it doesn't matter. The rest of it would be good. It will still kill you. So. You gotta watch out whether it is completely true. If anyone's saying uh, something else, then you, you know make sure to compare with the scripture, uh, confirm it, uh, and even the scripture says uh, to test all things, uh, whether that's of God or not. Uh, sometimes we are, you know, we live in the in day in, in this these days that we become a little too uh, lazy. Uh, we don't really double check and research, and I think that's one of the reasons why there there are more uh, atheists uh, and even certain people uh, not completely uh, following the truth or lukewarm people. Uh, so to say, they kind of miss out on that, uh, you know, finding the truth. And, and I don't think we should just swallow uh, what other people say. And if there's something it's kind of fishy about it. It's best to uh, compare it and check it with the scripture. All right. Uh, thank you, Sam. You made some very good points. Uh, I don't know if Jackson is back yet. Oh, Jackson, mm -hmm. are you are you aware of what we're commenting on the verse? Um, the only thing I know is you're commenting on Genesis three five. Thanks to Bill's chat comment. So. Let me look that up real quick. Okay, uh, let me read that to you, and send you, I'd like to get your response to this. We know that this is the serpent speaking. In verse 4 he said, And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For, verse 5, For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Jackson? Well, it's a lie. I mean, it's it's very obvious that he's not saying the same thing that God is saying. And a half-truth is a lie, because I didn't die physically, so. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think that, uh, uh, number one, we know that God said that if you eat of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that you will surely die. And he even said that day. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, uh, somehow Eve, when she repeated it in a previous study, um, Bill noted that Eve added um, that not only eating it, but even touching it was, was where you would die. So um, uh, Eve added something that was not part of God's command. He never said don't touch it. He just said don't eat it. But So um, Bill made a good point last time about people adding to, to the word and, and uh, having a, you know, maybe after she touched it, she thought, hey, I didn't die, so it's okay to eat it. But the, here, here's the real question. Uh, certainly it's a lie, partly true, because if they eat of the, God, uh, the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they will have, know the difference between good and evil. But it also says that you shall be as gods, and he said that you won't die. So there's some very important lies in there, and there's just a little truth, as Sam says, and there's a verse in the scripture that says, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. So that's all it takes is uh, you can say a lot of truth and just put just enough in there so that everything is ruined. It's kind of like grace. When Paul says uh, you can't mix grace and works because if you add works to grace, it's no longer grace. So you can't even add even 1% grace to it or it's spoiled. And this is the same kind of thing with these lies. Uh, it's very clever, but here's the real problem. I posed this last time, and I, I think I might have surprised some people, but I said, uh, to me, the original sin was not the biting of the apples or the disobedience of God's command to not eat of that tree. So we know that they disobeyed. We know that they bit into the apple and ate it. Okay, And normally people think, well, that was the sin. But I think the sin followed before. I mean, I'm happy preceded that, and that is when they decided they were going to believe Satan instead of believing God. God says, don't eat of that tree or you will surely die that day, and then Satan contradicted him and said the opposite, you will not die. And so they had a choice. They could believe God, but they chose to believe the devil. So to me, it's the, the original sin is the same sin that people have to deal with today. The only sin that sends people hell to hell today is the sin of unbelief. We need to believe God. In this case, we know this God is Jesus Christ, our Savior. We need to believe him. We need to believe in him. So what gets us into heaven is belief. What made Adam and Eve fall was unbelief of God. And uh, so uh, let me, we can move on, but see what anybody uh, has to say about that point there. Just whoever talks first, go ahead. Yeah, only just to reconfirm that, you know, that the, the devil was crafty and he added, you know, truth to the lie or lie to the truth because that confirms it. In, in Genesis 3, chapter 22, all right, it says, And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become one of us to know good and evil, and now lest he put forth his hand and take also the tree of life and eat, and live forever. So God is even confirming that the devil, that they did, as soon as they eat that tree, they will know the difference between good and evil. You know, and they, so God is confirming. You know, they've got, they've got to become like us and have that, that knowledge of good and evil. So the devil's crafty, and he, he often does that. He will, he will spin a lie and add truth into it. Or speak some truth but spin a lie into it. That, that people, unless they're really attentive to the word and attentive to what the Lord is actually saying to them, you know, they, they can trip up and fall and make stupid mistakes. So be on guard. All right. Anybody else want to come out of that before we move on to another verse? Well, it re reminds me of the people who oppose or, or deny eternal security because they'll add something to never perish. We'll never perish if you continue or if you um, 
don't don't do certain sins or whatever. Notice how they're adding to the statement of of, of never perishing in in ten twenty eight. John ten twenty eight. I mean. Yeah, Amen. It's uh, it's like there's we know in in salvation the message of self salvation that we call the good news of the gospel. Uh, we know that it's simple, and there should be no ifs, ands, or buts following it. And uh, that, but that's the mistake people make with the the gospel, and also with the eternal security, as you point out. There is that they'll say they they're believing it and teaching it. But then they add, well, if you do this, or but you got to do that. So, yeah, that's um, that, when you add something, it spoils it. It's ruined, and it no longer does what it's supposed to do, which is save us and give us eternal life. All right, um, we'll move on to the next verse. Uh, verse six says, "And the woman, and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise." She took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. All right, whoever wants to speak first, go ahead. What, what interesting thing I've just noticed, and it's just dawned, dawned on me, it says that when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree decided to make one wise, she took the fruit there of it, did he? So when she ate it, she then became wise, almost like the serpent became wise, and then she then beguiled, <laughs> beguiled Adam. So it was a chain reaction going on there. So you had the, the serpent who was wiser than all the other creatures beguiled Eve, Eve, Eve out of the tree, you know, out of the, you know, the, the fruit. She then became wise, and then was you know subtle enough to beguile even Adam. So then Adam had it afterwards. That's just an interesting, you know, chain of events of, of this this knowledge, this wisdom, and this beguiling, you know, sense, you know, what was going on. Yeah, there's a there's a lot of temptation uh, that Eve in, is uh, facing. Uh, the, temp, the temptation of uh, that. Uh, uh, it, it looked. It, it was good looking. It looked pleasant to the eyes. Uh, it was uh, good for food. A tree to be desired to make one wise. Now, I, I think most people would conclude that the the main interest that Eve had was this idea that was expressed earlier that Satan says that uh, your eye shall be opened. And you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And uh, that relates to this part in verse 6. It says, to, uh, a tree to be desired to make one wise. The wisdom that they, she acquired was the knowledge of good and evil. Um, I don't know if um, you guys have followed uh, Aaron Budgen and uh, Grace Fruits, those two channels. But they, they have both made a lot of videos talking about this this idea of the the two trees, the uh, the the tree of of life, uh, they call it the Christmas tree, because Christ is re that tree represents Christ, uh, because he is life, he is life everlasting, and he was hung on a tree, so the tree of life is a picture of Jesus Christ, salvation and grace, and this relationship with God, and then the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is a picture of the law and man's desire to go his own way and say to God, God, I know that uh, uh, it's been good, but I, I'd like to go this other way. I want to learn all this knowledge. I want to try to achieve things on my own. And uh, that's, the, that's the choice they made. They, they decided that they wanted to acquire knowledge apart from God, and instead of just being content with what God was providing for them, they were tempted by getting knowledge of good and evil, and therefore becoming like God in that way. So anybody want to respond to that? I, I found that those two channels have done a lot of teaching on that, and that's something that I really had never pictured before. I've never seen a picture of those two trees in that way. Well, for me, I think that the uh, verse 6 basically, you know, 
explain to us how uh, how temptation can lead to disobedience. Uh, it starts from temptation, and then uh, and from that on, if if you don't have enough faith, you're gonna little doubts uh, gonna grow, and when when they do grow in your heart, then the confusion will rise. And because that sort of doubts and confusions, uh, you are led to disobedience. And I think the uh, that's what that what that's what happened here uh, with Eve. And unfortunately, and she also gave this to to her husband. You know, so I think it's very important for us to really. That's why one of the reasons. That's why I think it's. Uh, this is very important to be awake and uh, make sure that we keep uh, the Word of God close so that, you know, we can have that shield of faith. Uh, so whenever this sort of temptation flies about, you know, these fiery darts, then we can, we can block them. We can block away all those doubts and confusions and have no room for any sort of disobedience. Okay, amen. Uh, anybody else want to comment on verse 6 uh, before we move on? Okay, I'll go to verse 7. And the, uh, and the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. All right. Yeah, you've got the first. You've got the first example there of lordship salvation. To be honest, you know they 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 sewed fig leaves together. They tried to make right. You know that they, they, they was naked and they thought, oh, we better hide ourselves. We better go so we you know God doesn't see us. naked, blah blah blah. So that is the first case, in my eyes, of man trying to work or do something. To, to cover, you know, and become righteous. You know, they knew they fell, they knew they was unrighteous, so they got, so, you know, these leaves, sewed them up and, and, and hid themselves. Because like wrong we, we see, don't we, you know, that giving too much of the story away, we see that God rejecting that attempt of self-righteousness and having to make, you know, garments for them. So I think that's very important. That's what sticks out for me anyway. Yeah, uh, I, I have a, a series of hangouts, uh, and it's called The Bloody Trail. And it's, it's starting from Genesis 1, 1, all the way through the scriptures, showing all of the Old Testament pictures of Jesus' blood atonement. Uh, and and the, the first example, of course, is this: these two trees. You know, you have the tree of life versus the tree of death. And, and then this is the second example that Bill pointed out here, is that... Uh, Adam and Eve saw, realized there was a problem. They realized they were naked, and they knew this was wrong. For they, 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 they didn't realize something was wrong before. They were naked before, apparently, but they, they, they weren't alarmed by it. But now they're alarmed by being naked, and they felt there was a need to cover up. But rather than relying on God to call it, solve the problem, they decided that they could do it by putting on some, covering themselves with fig leaves. Uh, that gets us to a, a question here. Uh, well, first, go ahead and comment on this verse further before I f ask the question. If anybody else wants to say anything on that. Well, I just wanted to, like, touch upon uh, the fact that they, uh, they knew that they were naked and they saw fig leaves together. Uh, now, we got to ask then... Um, who, whom were they trying to hide their naked body from? Obviously, they were, you know, husband and wife. Uh, I don't think even even now, husband and wife, we are not ashamed being naked. So obviously, here they were trying to hide themselves from God. I think with uh, touching upon what Brother Bill said, with what they have done, which is. Uh, you know, sewing uh, figs leaves together, 
which is also quite temporal because fig, li fig leaves they you know they although they do their purpose you know you got to replace them quite often probably you know they dry out they they fall off so you know they put together something you know not that permanent to hide from God and I think that's what I, 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 I thought that was pretty interesting Jackson do you want to comment on that frankly I think that um, Sam and Bill have really all, already sort of um, enunciated my thoughts you all know right. the first example of a work salvation mentality I agree but it's a natural response because man since he naturally thinks that he can do it if he tries hard enough. All right, very good. I, I think that is the important lesson to be learned from that. But there's something else that I don't think this is really that important, but it's curious uh, to me. Uh, I think the world as a whole thinks Adam and Eve ate an apple. And then I've also heard it taught that they ate grapes because Somehow they think grapes make wine, causes drunkenness, and you know. So I've heard it taught that it was grapes, not not uh, an apple. But do you think it's a coincidence that they covered themselves with fig leaves? Immediately their eyes were opened, and then they covered themselves with fig leaves. Could that be a clue that perhaps what they ate were was a fig, since the fig leaves were the ones that were so close and handy? They probably worked. <laughs> Where the scriptures silent, I like to be silent. So I would, I, I, I don't have any response to that. Well, that's good. You, you, you certainly shouldn't, uh, you shouldn't be dogmatic about it. You know how much I don't like dogmatism. You shouldn't be, uh, say, thus saith the Lord, like you know, you're declaring this is the truth. Yeah, if you, if you don't believe it was fake, if you don't believe Adam and Eve ate figs, you're not saved, right? <laughs> but I think it's perfectly okay to discuss it and speculate on it. Uh, hey, Joanne, you got your audio working, Joanne? Looks like your picture is frozen. Can you hear me? I can hear you, but your video picture is frozen. Yeah, no, I'm uh, not very well, so <laughs> I'm not. Oh, okay. That's fine. As long as as long as your audio is here, I, have you been listening along at all? No, I've only just uh, just come on. Sorry, I haven't been well, and I'm yeah. Just all right. Well, rather rather than trying to rather than trying to re refresh everything, get review everything, uh, we'll just let you pick up as we as we go along here. But I'm glad you could join us. Uh, everybody, if you don't know this, this is uh, Sister Joanne. She she lives in Australia. So uh, we've got England, Australia, and uh, California and, Nev and Nevada, and the U.S. represented here. So, um, all right. So we're we just we're speculating that the when Adam and Eve covered themselves up with fig leaves, sewed fig leaves together, is that a clue that perhaps the fruit they ate was not an apple, but it was but rather was was a fig. So uh, now, <laughs> Joanne, have you ever heard about heard that theory before? Sorry, brother. Have you ever heard the theory that uh, Adam and Eve ate a fig because they covered themselves up with fig leaves, so therefore the the fruit they ate must have been a fig rather than, than an apple? There's. Yeah, I've, um, I've well, I haven't heard, but I've seen pictures of yeah. Um, the Bible clearly states that it's an apple, not a fig. Yeah, I, there's no way that, that uh, the scriptures tell us exactly what it was. I don't know how, who came up with the idea that it was an apple, um, but it's been it's been the, the predominant uh, opinion throughout history, I guess. Uh, but to me, I, I just think that uh, this is a clue. But Jackson says this is something that uh, you, we that uh, uh, the scriptures are not clear on, so we shouldn't really. Uh, put too much confidence in that and I think he's correct. Okay, now we'll move on to the next verse. You want to know something, an interesting parallel right before we move on is a long time ago, but I still remember this, many years ago my grandfather and I, because we used to have a daily devotional together, 
looked up in Jonah what the word whale, for in the King James it says the whale swallowed Jonah, and it says great fish in some other translations. The mo apparent, According to our study, the most accurate translation of that, of this big animal that swallowed Jonah, is sea monster, which could be any big thing in the sea. For all we know, a giant squid could have swallowed him. Hello? Sorry, sorry. It's uh, my my cursor is not real reliable right now for some reason. It took me a while to unmute my microphone. Yeah, these are things that to me part of part of the fun of Bible study is this kind of speculating, this kind of discussion. Uh, but again, nobody here is claiming that uh, this is a you know uh, it's absolute fact the way that we're interpreting it or or are speculating here we're just speculating trying to learn and, and uh, see what we can come up with but uh, um, and I think that is beneficial all right well let's go on to this next verse here and it is uh, um, uh, and they heard the voice of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Joanne, what we're doing here is anybody who wants to talk just unmutes their mic and starts talking. So whoever's ready first, make a comment on that. Okay. Oh. I'll comment then. No one's comment. What what I noticed at this, and I always have noticed at this, is the fact that that there was obviously before the fall uh, an intimacy between God and mankind, because he walked in the garden, and it seems the way it's written that that was the usual thing to do, you know, God to do, you know, to walk in the garden at the cool of the day. So up to the point they would have probably, you know, had communion with God. And they wouldn't have been afraid, and they wouldn't have noticed themselves naked, and they would have had an intimate relationship with God. And ever since the fall, that's changed, and they've hid from God. So you know what I see is an intimacy before the fall, and a fear after the fall. Uh, yeah, I, I think there's some interesting points to be made in that, but I'm, I'll let, give everybody a chance to chime in first before I say what I'm thinking. Anybody yeah, else has? Yeah. For me, like, uh, you know, that verse, you know, tells us that uh, they've been hearing uh, the voice of the Lord uh, because, I mean, I'm sure this is not only the first time they heard him. And also, we know that, uh, you know, the Lord, uh, God, taking a stroll in the garden, so he must have taken that sort of walk more than once. In the cool of the day, um, again we see that, uh, as Brother Bill said, uh, they they're hiding. They're hiding from God. So uh, it tells you exactly what happens when uh, when sin enters you. Whether that would be the first sin or second sin, it doesn't matter. It just uh, when that enters you. Uh, that will keep you away from God. So, um, I guess that also shows that if you, if we want to be in the presence of God, I think we uh, should be naked before God, and at the same time, uh, if we can, uh, sort of say, keep ourselves righteous and holy. Uh, as, as much as possible, then we can also uh, actually be in his presence, apparently. Uh, I'm not saying, of course, that if, if you are not in the presence, I'm not saying that you are, you are not saved, of course, but if you are indeed uh, in the presence of God, then uh, you are more or less, uh, less sinning, so to say, than others, <laughs> so, so um, 
I guess when when they were hiding from them, uh, because the scene entered, and which makes them, uh, make, which keeps them away from God, and as, ever since then, I think mankind has been building up more sin, and and more and more we are away from God, uh, in absence from the presence of God, so to say. Uh, interesting verse, I thought. Yeah, yeah, Sam, you made a good point. I wanted, I, I was going to comment on that further, but let me see if anybody, uh, Jackson or Joanne, wants to say anything before I go on. All right then. Uh, to me, uh, the, the point Sam made about uh, they hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. This is the beginning of the separation, as, as Sam pointed out. Uh, sin uh, created a barrier, a separation between man and God, and they immediately knew that they couldn't be near God. They were, had to hide from him. They, they, they decided that uh, they were ashamed. And, uh, and today, we have most people of the world you know, still hiding from God. And, and that's what we have to first thing a person must do is is have a desire for for God and uh, not want to hide from him but you know knock seek and and uh, what's the how's it goes ask seek and knock and uh, the other thing is that stands out to me is that I believe this is the first point in the scriptures where God becomes uh, really uh, theistic uh, rather than deistic and anthropom anthropomorphic. Uh, in other words, uh, the Lord walking in the garden of the cool of the day, uh, we get the visual a vision of, of him actually walking. It says that God was, man was made in God's image. So now we put it two and two together and say, okay, uh, God is actually walking in the garden. So he must have two legs like Adam. He's anthropomorphic. Uh, uh, there's many examples uh, in the scriptures of God uh, on earth as as a with a body and a, per a person. These are called theophanies, or sometimes people call them Christophanies. Where, uh, for example, uh, when uh, was it Jacob that wrestled with with uh, the angel of God? Uh, that, that was wrestling with God, or, or uh, when when the, the the two angels and the the, the three were at the uh, with Abraham before Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, uh, the, when when they were in the furnace of fire, and there was a third person, I mean a fourth person in the furnace with them, who the, that looked like the Son of God. Um, these are times where God appears uh, with among us. As a person, uh, so some people think that it's God generically more of a you know they're not necessarily saying this is Jesus Christ pre-incarnation, but it's that's what they call a theophany where God appears as a as a man uh, as he as he's walking in the garden. There's no reference of Jesus at this point, so some people say, well, this is maybe God the Father who's walking in the garden. And then there's other times in scriptures where people say it's a Christophany, where they go a step further and say this is a pre-incarnation uh, appearance of Jesus. So uh, that, to me, I thought was interesting. Is anybody familiar with that concept? Yeah, yeah, I'm familiar with Christophany, Theophany, and all those concepts. Yeah, they're very interesting. But I'm probably in line with what everyone else thinks on the panel. I think this is more likely uh, to be a, a Theophany as opposed to a Christophany, because I think the first Christophany is where, where uh, with Abraham, is what I believe. Mm -hmm. All right, anybody want to voice an opinion on that before we move on? Okay, uh, let's go. Um. And the, and the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? 
Well, I thought God was omniscient. Anyway? Well, you know, obviously God wants, God wants them to come out of their own, you know. God is not going to force them to, you know, hey, if you don't come out, I know where you are. If you don't come out, I'm going to beat the heck out of you. You know, God is not doing that, obviously. He's, he's being a loving God, uh, even if that means he got to pretend. And, of course, pretend doesn't mean lying. Uh, so that, you know, he can give us um, more chance to come to him. You know, it's, it's another, another gesture from God, uh, loving God, I think. Anyone else? Very good point, Sam. I think that's a perfectly expressed what was going on there. Uh, now let's go verse 10. And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, uh, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. I'll read the next one. And he said, this is God, who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree where have I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? Yes, this is a similar point, I think, Sam. You want to elaborate on that? Right, same thing. You know, he he knew what they've done. Still, you know, he wants his his father, uh, you know, giving giving them his gesture. Uh, of love in a way and um, obviously he knew that uh, they have had, had that uh, and also he just wanted to bring out certain uh, certain I, I don't know how should I say it certain excuse maybe and he's asking who told you who told thee that thou was naked you know um, I guess if I were to be asked that then I would kind of <laughs> I don't know if I would lie. Uh, I would say, "Oh yeah, Satan told me," <laughs> you know. But um, um, yeah, it's another gesture that uh, you know. Hey, I'm just giving you another chance. You better come up clean. Uh, so I think that's what he's doing right now. Uh, anybody else want to elaborate on that? I think Sam's uh, right again, and that this is. Uh, you know, this is to me is a picture of uh, we understand God as Father. Uh, I don't know if, if your parents ever did this to you, or maybe you did this to your children, but you know exactly what they did was wrong, and you're very much aware of it. But you start asking them questions to see if they will, you know, fess up, and, and uh, instead of just coming out and saying, "I know you did this," you give them a chance to. Uh, come to you and say, yes, this, this this is what I did, and, you know, repent and say I'm sorry. And, but uh, so I, I think this is just a, a perfect example of showing me that, you know, this loving Father God, uh, the way he's uh, dealing with them. Okay. Um, and now verse 12 and the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to me, to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. <laughs> and the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. Okay? <laughs> Yeah, brother Bill, go ahead, brother Bill. Yeah, yeah and now, now starts the blind game. Instead of, instead of just dialing up, you know, what Adam should have said, well, poor old Eve was deceived by that horrible serpent. He didn't bother, it's the blind game. He, bl he blamed Eve straight away, and then Eve said, well, it was the serpent, and it was, yeah, it was the blind game beginning. It would have probably been better if, if you know, he just straight away said, well, the serpent done this, and poor old Eve you know, was tricked into it, you know, he didn't take responsibility, he just blamed. You know, you know also that uh, I want to point out that the, um, uh, check out what the man is saying. He's saying, uh, the women whom thou gavest to be with me, 
I mean, he didn't have to say this in, in the first place. And secondly, he's blaming God for his sin. You see, so I think that's one of the things that uh, we notice a lot, especially these days. A lot of atheists, atheists blaming God for their sin, uh, when actually they are the one who made that choice. And some people even go farther, saying that, "Oh, God is making man to sin." You know, I hear that a lot from universalists. Uh, God is, of course, because God is making, you know, God is saving people, you know, God is making also people to sin. When it's in fact that clearly as it's written, man is the one sinning, man is making that choice to sin. Uh, whether, whether, you, whether you sin or not, it's your choice, of course, because why? You know good and evil, that's your choice. So here, Adam, like a fool, uh, Blaming God here for what he has done. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say I'm, I'm absolutely amazed you just brought it up because I've not seen that before. I've not actually seen that before. So I'm actually, I'm actually impressed there. That's going to be a keeper and I'm going to put that down in my notes. Right, write it down, write it down. Kudos. <laughs> That's a keeper. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that is an important point to make, is that uh, Adam, a lot of people think that Adam is blaming the woman, but if you really understand, as Sam's pointing out here, uh, really God is ultimately to blame the way Adam is, is phrasing it, because he says, the woman that thou gavest to me. I mean, if you hadn't given me this woman, this would never have happened. God, it's your fault. Uh, and, then, and, then, and she's the one that gave me this to eat. So he's not accepting any responsibility. It's God's fault, it's Eve's fault, and it's denying and not accepting responsibility. Uh, I, I think relating this to today and uh, people, you know, it, it's, it, that's relevant today too, that oh, we need to accept the fact that, hey, no, it's uh, all have sinned, and that includes me. And, uh, and we have to need to understand that, yes, I am a sinner, and uh, I can't cover myself up with fig leaves and, and solve the problem. Uh, uh, admit that I have a problem. I can't solve the problem. I need to rely on God to solve the problem for me. And that's the, that's the way it was before the fall. The relationship that they had with God was uh, a relationship based upon uh, the tree of life. They didn't know the difference between good and evil. There was no need for that. Uh, they just knew that they had a relationship with each other and with God, and everything was good. Uh, but then when they were tempted to have learned about the good and the evil, and their eyes were opened, uh, e everything changed because they desired to kind of go their own way. And, and, uh, say, uh, it, We're not content having this wonderful relationship with the garden, with God providing everything for us. We're not content. We want to be like God. We want to know good and evil. And then they ended up, their eyes were opened, and then they're afraid. And then they're denying responsibility. Um, All right, we'll go on unless uh, someone else. One other comment that I have, actually, is um, related to this, is that a lot of times I hear people say that Adam, or, or Eve more specifically, committed the first sin by um, by eating the fruit, and I actually don't, I guess in light of this, I don't technically think we can say that because it was a, certainly a sin for Satan to tempt Eve in the first place, and that's a sin that came before them eating the fruit. Well, uh, we have, it's absolutely true that before man fell, uh, the angels had their own fall, led by Lucifer, who w it was the same thing. He wanted to ascend uh, above God, and he convinced a third of the angels to, to join him, and they, they rebelled, and then he put the same thought, he tickled Eve's ear with the same idea that, no, you won't really die. You'll, you'll just be like God and no good and evil. So uh, the first sin, of course, was that we know of in the scriptures is when Lucifer fell and the angels fell, 
But the first sin of man we discussed earlier, I put forth the idea that it was not the uh, actual eating of the fruit and the disobedience, but it was the actually before that when they were given the choice to believe God or believe the devil. And they chose to believe the devil instead, who, who said, no, it's not true what God said. You won't surely die. He just doesn't want you to have it because you'll be like God and no good and evil. And they had a choice. They could believe God or believe Satan. And it's the same problem we have today, and it's it's the sin of unbelief. The, that's the first sin. Okay. Uh, Jackson, any, any response to that before we move on? No, not other than what I already said. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, now verse 14. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt shalt thou eat all the days of thy life and I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed and it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel I think those verses go together there so the first prophecy in the scriptures go ahead who wants to speak on that yeah, I'm just going to say, yeah, the first prophecy in the scriptures. It's actually, you know, even talking about the seed, singular, i.e. that is expressly talking about the seed of Eve, which shall become Christ Jesus, and obviously that, 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 that Satan's head shall be bruised. You know, it should be it should be crushed underfoot. And this is what happened, you know, at Calvary, and then afterwards, as the church, you know, became you know, a force in that sense against evil. So, yeah, it's almost like a double prophecy there. Not only is it describing what's going to happen, you know, at Calvary, it's describing that the woman's seed shall be this Christ who shall, fulfill, you know, fulfill this at Calvary. So, yeah, very important verse. For me, it also, um, not only uh, that, that's a representation of, uh, direct line uh, you know when it says thy see um, between thy see and her seed and obviously we know that that is you know the uh, between Christ and Satan and how Christ will conquer and defeat uh, whatever Satan has done uh, and also I think you know it, when it says seed you know, I, I think we can consider that as more than one seed. Uh, I know it doesn't say seeds. Uh, that would complicate uh, more, I think. And uh, when he says seed, I think it could represent the body of Christ as well, uh, because seed bearing other seeds as well. You know, the same kind of seed. And I think that's one of the reasons why. Uh, we the saints will will judge some of some of these um, angels that follows Lucifer, uh, and though I think and also the uh, thou shall bruise his heel. That part is kind of when when your heel is bruised, you know you have some sort of hindrance in moving about, but it doesn't really affect your life in any way. So that's I think that's what Satan does all the time, try to hinder uh, the body of Christ, try to you know, but the body of Christ uh, will not uh, lose its uh, its life. Um, I don't know if um, I, maybe that's one of the reasons why Satan uh, likes to uh, accuse brethren day and night, and that sort of the accusations and blames sort of hinders uh, the saints. Uh, I mean, at least for me, I get accused a lot. <laughs> and, uh, but it doesn't affect my faith in any way. Uh, so maybe that's a little bit of, you know, different interpretation. 
a different perspective, I thought. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's that's different. I've never heard uh, to related to the church before. Uh, the the standard viewpoint on this scripture here, the reason we called it pro first prophetic verse, uh, is that the way that uh, I've seen it interpreted is that uh, first of all, this is God speaking to Satan, and he's saying uh, he's something that will happen in the future. So this is a prophecy, and the, the, he says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman. The woman, of course, uh, is the, uh, the mankind, through Eve, mankind comes, and there's mm -hmm. enmity, uh, and, and Satan is, uh, is, is um, affecting or, or uh, against mankind, even... Till today, Satan is still against mankind. Between thy seed and her seed, uh, thy her seed. Uh, most people see this as Jesus Christ. That this the seed of the woman. Eventually, it's just like the seed of Abraham. That's also singular. And uh, some people say it's talking about the nation of Israel, but. It's, it's talking about the the one person that comes out of the nation of Israel, the Messiah. And this verse is also talking about this one person that comes out of the seed of the woman. That, now, so it's between uh, Satan and the Messiah. And, and Satan's going to bruise his heel. In other words, what what happens to Jesus Christ is just a minor thing. He he's tortured and he dies, but he gets the victory. He's raised from the dead. But what happens to to Satan eventually? Jesus has the victory, and it's serious what happens. Uh, that it shall bruise thy head. I think in other translations it says it shall crush thy head. Uh, so, yeah, Satan seems to have a, a victory on the cross until the resurrection. And then we see that, uh, no, he didn't get the victory. Jesus has the victory, and eventually Satan will be crushed. All right, before we go on, anybody else want to comment or elaborate any further on that? Yeah, um, I actually have, um, yeah. Look, I just, from what I, uh, I can see and understand, sorry for my slowness today, I'm, bit, yeah, not being well, but, um, I just see look from a gracious, I see a gracious promise being made here um, of Christ uh, as the deliverer of you know the full, of fallen man uh, from the power of Satan. Um, though that being said, um, and was as, as yeah, it was addressed uh, to the serpent. Yet it was a sitting hearing of you know like our first parents. Um, who doubtlessly uh, took the hints of grace here given to them and uh, saw, you know, we see a door of hope opening to them. Um, and, um, you know, in the, yeah, in the following sentence upon themselves uh, would have overwhelmed them. Um, you know, here's the dawning of uh, the gospel day, I suppose. Um, you know, and no sooner was you know the wound given than the than the remedy was uh, provided and revealed. Um, yeah, that's yeah. All right, sister. Thank you. Um, the um, the. the one thing about scriptures is that there's so many different ways that things that we can learn. Sometimes I think that there's a clear intention of a scripture, and then there's also other things that we can glean and we can we can uh, learn from it, even though that was not the primary reason it was written. But and yet we we still get something out of it that is not uh, uh, it, it, it's it's so rich what we can gain from from all the scriptures. Um, now let's go on to this 
verse 16. God speaking to Eve. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and, the, and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Okay, that should be pretty controversial. Well, it's controversial in a lot of ways, that one. A lot of ways. <laughs> oh, well, well, I'll tell you what I've learned recently. All right? It's just a, a different spin on a perspective. Like, you know, if it, the, the basic orthodoxy understanding of this verse is that obviously the husband should, should rule over, over the wife. Okay. And the controversial one is it says, you know, it says, and thy desire shall be to thy husband. Them few words there is controversial. Because the orthodoxy says it, it, that her desire is to, you know, be kind of underfoot to her husband. And the controversy is that what it could be expressing is that she's going to keep trying to... to to desire the position of, as husband. So there's going to be an enmity between, you know, who's the head here? Is it the man and the woman? The man or the woman? So there's there's two, you know, opinions on that. So you can overtake the orthodox view that, you know, the woman is, is, is below the man as part of the fall, or it is that there's going to be an, a new enmity between man and woman, and the woman is going to be desirous of the man's headship and the man's position which, you know, we actually see quite a lot in, in, in modern-day society. So it's just, you know, interesting perspective on that. Yeah, wow, that's uh, that's news to me, brother. I've never heard that before. That's interesting. I can see, I can see how you can uh, uh, derive that. You know, today I think, again, I don't, I'm not a great historian, but from what I know about history, uh, I think today, more than ever before, uh, women have tried to uh, um, not have this role of being uh, uh, the husband's in charge of the wife, and the woman is not, not only equal, but maybe the head. Sometimes someone has to uh, stay home with the children, and someone has to work. It used to be the man that would work and provide, and the women stayed home with children, but now, in America at least, uh, people are taking that as that they're interchangeable. Well, if the woman has a can earn more money, she's got a better career, let her do the work and the man stays home with the children. So the woman is taking over that role. Uh, see, I think today, more than ever before, this is a, a, a struggle that's going on and it's pretty much accepted in America that uh, they're kind of interchangeable parts now. Uh, so that's an interesting point you made. I want to also ask about the other part of the, the verse. Um, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow shalt thou bring forth children. Um, I believe this is true. From my research, I, I don't know of any animals that scream in, in agony as they're giving childbirth. Uh, they're they're silent. Uh, it seems like the childbirth just happens, and there's no there's no pain. But uh, with mankind, the woman suffers horribly. Uh, when my wife gave childbirth, it was uh, 12 hours, and it, they call it labor. It was definitely worse than labor. It was it was like being tortured all that time, and uh, so it's. Is it, is it true that uh, uh, only women, humans, suffer in childbirth? I believe that no other animals do. So if that's the case, then, um, uh, you know, this, this would be very uh, revealing, what this verse tells us. And, you know, like, uh, where it says, Thy desire shall be to thy husband. Uh, and he shall rule over thee. Uh, just wondering, um, I wonder what it was like then before they, you know, they sinned. Uh, because God is, this is like a command in a way, but, you know, 
prophecy and also command, thy, you know, thy, thy desire shall be to thy husband, as if the, her desire wasn't to her husband before. And he shall rule over thee, as if it wasn't like that before. So I don't know what, what your thoughts are on that. Uh, yeah, that's uh, to me. That's an interesting point that uh, I hadn't really considered. That that maybe before the fall, uh, apparently before the fall, the relationship between Adam and Eve was was, was totally different. There was no superiority. There was no uh, uh, headship. Uh, they were just basically uh, two people that loved each other and loved God, and there was no like. Uh, hierarchy, you know, I'm in charge. But now God seems to say in the future, it's not going to be like it was. Now you're going to be under man, he's going to be the head. And uh, as Bill said, uh, the woman will uh, uh, desire shall be to thy husband. Maybe that desire is to, no, she doesn't want to be uh, second in command, she wants to be in charge. So these are all interesting things that um, we can try so, to like, figure out. Meaning, in other words, like for me, without sin, uh, then you know, just like what you were saying, it would be like you know, before we fell, before they sin, uh, we will not have that sort of uh, hierarchy. Uh, but um, have have equal fitting, just like just like the angels uh, when we are in the kingdom of God, I think. That's yeah. That's, Joanne is silent on this. Um, yeah, let me see. She's making some, making some comments. Uh, uh, what do you think about this idea of the childbirth, uh, the pain in the childbirth, and the man being in charge at this point? Well, in regards to childbirth, um, I'm sure everyone out there who's had a wife um, that's delivered a child would have some idea um, of, of the pain um, that a woman goes through. Um, I, I put up a, um, a verse a little minute ago from uh, John 16, 21. Um, oh, a woman, when she is in travail, hath sorrow, because her hour is come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish, for joy that a man is born into the world. Um, it's funny. I only just come across that by accident, actually. <laughs> um, but it, my uh, daughter, uh, well, I'm a grandmother, and uh, when my daughter was in labour, um, I can remember saying to her, look, you know, it will be over very soon. Yes, it is going to hurt. Yes, it's going to be painful. And yes, you're going to be labouring. Um, but at the end, you're going to hold this little baby in your arms. And yes, you'll remember the fact that it hurt, but you actually won't remember the pain anymore or how bad it really was. Um, and the same was for me. Um, yes. It may have been, you know, um, it's a sweet pain. And even though that God, it was a punishment for, for the sin, um, the original sin, he never left us without um, something good at the end. It's, it's not like hopeless. You know, at the end we have this baby in our arms and this joy and to a point it's all, the rest is, for, the rest of the pain and the suffering is gone. Um, so, yeah, I, I guess that's um, a point that 
that sort of came up for me. But um, in regards to um, women and submitting, um, my point would be, or my opinion and my belief, is that every woman should submit to their husband. Now, in saying that, I don't mean that the woman is under the thumb or to be abused or to be used or anything else. Um, but if you have a Christian man, then he's your spiritual head within your family. And, you know, we are asked by God of all people to to take that and not and have freedom within that. You know, like God's given the responsibility, a big responsibility to the man, which is the head of the house. You know, he's um, you know, he's out working, he's out doing hopefully uh, out um, evangelizing, um, he's out he's got a million jobs and responsibilities to do, you know. We're supposed to be there to help them be able to do that without being a stumbling block to the man. Um, you know, and there's a sense of freedom. I mean, I don't, I would dearly like to, um, you know, and my husband only just got there, <laughs> so there's a lot to go yet, um, and I'm very grateful. Um, but Ideally, I would just love a lot of that responsibility off my shoulders and to be guided um, by a spiritual man who his life is in within Christ. There is nothing more wonderful. But also, I see, I also have, I see the side of the woman always struggling with that. You know, it's not just a male opinion. It's a, the woman actually struggles with it. I struggle with that, of being submissive in the actual real meaning of it. Um, you know, because I'm always fighting for that one on top. You know, and I have to smack myself. You know, not you know, not literally, but you know, pull myself back and go, hey. You know, what am I doing here? I'm actually, you know. You know, um, pulling my husband down by trying to take over something. He's he he knows what he's doing. You know, um, why am I interfering with that? You know, when I don't have anything to, you know, he knows what he's doing. He knows his job. He knows his. Why am I inter trying to interfere with with his job? I don't work there. I know nothing about the. You know the job that he does. I know nothing about building, but yet I'm trying to, you know, you, you find yourself without realising sometimes that you're trying to step that bound. And, and it's a real struggle. And I think most women, if they're honest, will admit to that. Yeah, well, I think I've... Uh... I've gleaned three things from what you've you said. First, uh, every you know how happy everybody is about your husband's new birth, and that was just within this last few days. So that I mean, there's no happier occasion. I mean, you were happy when your your children were born. You born. You're talking about childbirth and the the how hard it was, and yet the joy of when they're born. And and now I don't know how many years you've been married, but now you have the new birth of your your husband, and that I'm sure that is uh, one of the happiest times of your life. You've also you've also got, uh, as you said, you pointed out something that Bill was mentioning in the verse earlier, that uh, you've kind of it's been tempted to try to be in charge, uh, and uh, that's what Bill was referring to. How some people see that verse. Uh, uh, and thy desire shall be to thy husband. Uh, Bill says that that means that the wives will desire the husband's headship. And and yet you also said that you would really like to not be the head, but be the, be the helper and let him be, be the head. I do think that uh, 
the way that God has it had planned it for for man to go out of the home and be the hunter or be the farmer and be out there working and providing and the woman to stay in the home and be the nurturer and the, the, the mother and the caretaker of the children and the mother helping the the, the, the wife helping the husband uh, to me that's a, a beautiful team concept and it's uh, you know as I said earlier men and women are different uh, Time magazine about 1970 had it on their headlines on the cover men or women are different like it's some great revelation they just discovered but we're not only anatomically different designed to come together but we're psychologically emotionally uh, even chemically uh, hormonally different and we're designed to work together and be a team so I, I do think that yeah when a, if a woman even though sometimes may have that temptation to say gosh uh, I want to be in charge uh, well but if they can learn to be content and saying no it's best to have it as a team effort I'll let him be in charge and do the things that he can do best and I'll help out I think that it'll probably be the most productive way to to, to live exactly exactly brother and um, you know we I think that you know in regards to men and women being different I think they also think very differently now you know I, I think the innate way of men thinking is logically not saying that they don't have emotional thoughts, but say just saying the the base root of their thoughts come from a logical perspective, and um, you know a, a woman's definitely comes from you know an emotional deep root perspective before it becomes you know like you have we have to think about it before we become or say something logical about you know what we intend and I, you know, I'm not trying to put women down because I'm one and I certainly don't want to be putting myself down in any way um, however that's just the truth of it and you know and I'm not saying women can't think logically of course they can um, but what I'm saying is that the basis of everything from a woman's does come from an emotional place and we can't all run around and be you know, totally emotional without having any logical, you know, like we, this is why we, you know, this is why God created, you know, man and woman. You know, it's that we're there to complement each other in every way, it's not just, you know, sexually, not just, um, you know, it's emotional, it's, um, it's, yeah, it is physical, it's emotional, it's, it's in every way possible. Um, you know, we're there to uplift each other and to, when we join, we join in more ways than just in a physical sense. Yeah, Sister, the, um, the differences between men and women, some of them are very obvious and some of them are uh, more subtle that you've mentioned. And, and today, uh, in this modern time, a lot of people are trying to deny these differences and uh, it is true that the way the men's and women's brains work and the, the, the hormone the chemistry going on men tend to be more calculating and cold and, 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 and uh, 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 re rational and reasoning and rather than emotion and caring and passionate and the women have that element that is necessary because what would it be like if we didn't have you know that kind of compassion and and uh, so uh, uh, what's happened to me though I'm 64 now and over the last five years or so I think the chemistry in my body is changing a little bit and, and I'm becoming emotional like a woman no you don't, don't laugh at that my husband <laughs> well he's, he's only um, you know what is he 49 going you know um, but um, since my grand, since our granddaughter actually, um, and you know my husband, he's uh, ex army, and you know he's he's such a man's man, man. You know, like there's just you look at him and you think you just don't know what he's thinking. He's like he's got this emotionless expression on his face half the time. That I mean, I know him now. I mean, you know, well enough now, and so I should. But when he meets people, there's like they just sort of they're shocked. Um, but he has 
since our, since our granddaughter, he has just mellowed out so much. And the emotional side that he would never show, you know, we were at the shops the other day and um, there was a lady with, you know, with a baby in the, you know, in the stroller and he's like, oh, isn't that a cute baby? You know, I'm, I'm looking at him like, who stole my husband? Like, he would never have done that. He would have just walked right past. It's, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Sorry, can't hear you. Okay, yeah, it's, it's, I'm a little slow getting the mute button pressed because of my cursor, but uh, uh, okay, I think that was a worthwhile discussion, but uh, I, let's move on to the next verse unless someone else wants to add to that. We'll move on. Um, and unto Adam, he said, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and has eaten of the tree, of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herbs of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it was thou taken. For dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. Wow. Yep. Yeah. I, 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 do you know what? I, I was taught this many years ago, and I, and I, was, I would have never noticed it of myself. It was like one of the moments, like Sam had earlier on, to suddenly interject something poignant that you've never seen before. Someone pointed this out to me from verse 17 years ago. And basically the part is, it says, towards the end of, of, of verse 17 it says, curse is the ground for thy sake. All right? Now at my initial reading of that years ago, I thought, oh, things are real bad there. But then someone pointed out to me, that was the first blessing in disguise. And I said, what do you mean? They said, God could have utterly cursed the man. But he loved the man so much, he decided to curse the ground for his sake. Well, I, I can see how you can draw that out of that verse, uh, and, and that is uh, interesting. I never heard that take on it. But in other words, for the sake of man, because God loved, still loved man, he's not going to curse the man in, in, as in the way that he could, but he's going to curse the ground. Yeah, of course, we know that man was also cursed because we have death. You know, we have you know, all of the things that come because of the fall. Um, but here we have, you know, he's, God, he talks to the serpent first, tells what's going to happen to him, then he talks to Eve and says what's going to happen to her, and then he talks to Adam and says what's going to happen to him, so he's pronouncing judgment on, on all of them during this, this section here, uh, but he's, when we talk about the fall, you know, this is showing you that the fall is not just the fall of man, but even even the ground, and the the, the thorns and the thistles. The 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 creation itself fell, and and now everything is going to be a hardship for man instead of so easy. Well, this is kind of like beside the point, I think. But uh, we can also see that before the fall that uh, none had to work, I mean, I can see. I mean, you didn't have to sweat to get the food. Um, you didn't have to do anything with the ground. <laughs> you know, it just came out. It just, everything was free, so to say. And it also suggests that, uh, you know, in, we, before the fall, Adam and Eve could have been um, quite uh, 
I mean, it says, Thus thou art, and unto dust shall thou return. Um, until this time, they didn't have to return to dust again, almost. And, but now, after the fall, the uh, that we all ha we all now returning to dust. It seems. It. Uh... I made a video titled uh, A Matter of Life and Death. Yeah, so everybody watch that if you get a chance. But the, uh, the idea uh, of learning about death for the first time, every person, unless you die when you're just a little infant and you never realize it, at some point, where you're, whether you're four or five or six or seven or eight or ten, or in Adam and Eve's case, that's what, at that point in their lives, they were told for the first time that they're going to die. And, uh, you know, I don't remember when, what age I was or who told me or, you know, how it was explained to me. But at some point we all are faced with this, that, hey, you don't, <laughs> there's going to come a point when you die. And uh, this is the point where Adam and Eve received that, that news that as a result of the sin. All right. Um, to verse 20, and Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skin and clothe them. Well, I think this verse here is a very, very important verse, verse 21. It relates to what we were discussing earlier. Anybody want to comment on the coats of skin? Yes, again, that's another picture. We're the first picture where where man tried to clothe himself with his own, you know, and this is a picture of self-righteousness. Uh, and in the end, God chose a clear picture of, no, this ain't acceptable. So God had to make this first sacrifice. Obviously, the creature had to shed blood, and, and God had to make the clothing, i.e. his righteousness. It's a picture of Christ's righteousness being placed upon Adam. So it was a fantastic picture you know, of what was going to occur you know, later on in time. Yeah, uh, you you have uh, you have the serpent and the heel and the wound the wounding the heel and wounding the head, but that's very vague. But to me, this is the, the first really clear picture of the what I call the bloody trail. Uh, from this point on, throughout the scriptures, over and over again, we see these things that show us that there's need there's a need for a blood covering. Uh, as, as Bill said, you know, Adam and Eve, they realized after they sinned, they were naked, they were afraid, and they decided they, there was a problem. They tried to solve the problem through their own works. They took trees, with fig leaves off, and made, sewed them together and covered themselves up, thinking that they could solve the problem. But apparently, God didn't accept that covering because he gave them another covering. And the covering he gave them was uh, was death was required. An animal had to die in order to provide those skins, and their blood had to be shed, and it, and, it, and God had to provide it. So these are all. It's the first indication of we see of, uh, of uh, re redemption and how we get redeemed and how we how we get saved, not through our efforts, but by God providing the salvation. Yeah, you know, I think also that the, um, you know, it, it says that uh, Adam called his wife, wife's name Eve. So I guess he didn't call her Eve by then, or that's her new name. I'm not sure. Um, and but what's for sure is that uh, Eve means the mother of all living. It, it, the the scripture defines what Eve meant, means here. Um, 
and also what brother was alluding that um, you know it's about sacrifice more or less and God has provided them with something more or less permanent at least during the, their lifetime I guess uh, to clothe them and it says uh, God actually clothed them so I thought that was quite interesting uh, before they clothe themselves now God clothed them you know Uh, God has clothed you, Brother Sam. He, he's given you this white robe of righteousness, uh, the righteousness of Jesus Christ. It's the transaction that uh, is uh, so so beautiful that uh, Jesus agrees to have our sins placed upon him. He became sin for us, paid for our sins. We put our faith in, in him for our salvation, and, and we receive his righteousness imputed to us as a covering, just like these skins covered Adam and Eve. So, um, yeah, God clothes us. He clothes uh, every one of us, and uh, I'm sure millions of other people throughout history. I, would, I don't even want to say billions, because I'm skeptical of the percentage of people who are really put their faith in the Savior. But uh, many people have received this clothing from God, this uh, righteousness of Jesus Christ that's imputed. Okay. Um, now, there's a concern here. Uh, verse 22, And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us. Again, this is God talking to someone and saying us. So uh, I don't know what you make of that, but he goes on to say, to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Uh, he, okay, we'll go on. And he was cast out, but, but just this verse here, verse 22. Yep, yeah, again, that, that in that first line, just the first portion of that, you know, proves that, yeah, you know, that, that, that God is triune. You know, he's talking as if it's us, not singular. He's not, you know, not, he's not, you know, schizophrenic or anything, talking to himself. God is talking to other parts of the Godhead, i.e., Christ and the Holy Ghost. So that's the first thing you can glean out of that. And obviously, the, the one is, you know, not only does he become like us, he knows good and evil. I, he, 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 he has power in a sense that, 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 that the things he does and things he do in life will have consequences now. You know, it's not, it's not going to be a, you know, a, a free ride with no consequences. You know, he can choose either to do good or he can choose to, to do evil. And it's even a classic verse to, to show that, you know, and it kills Calvinism. You know, that, that he's given free will here at this point. He can choose to do good and evil. You know, the same as God. You know, he's got free will. You know. So there's so much you can actually glean out of that. It's, it's actually amazing. But I'll let someone else, you know, continue with the second portion of that because there's just so much. Also, uh, do you think that uh, you know it, it's also, it's, it's, of course, it's to do with God the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit, the Trinity. But do you think God was also inclusive when He was talking about, uh, as if like He is also talking on behalf uh, of the, uh, for example, angels uh, who didn't fall off, who didn't fall, fell away. One of us, meaning the. Uh, God plus angels minus uh, Satan. I've, 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 yeah, I've heard that as well. I've heard because, that scenario, because yeah. when it says one of us doesn't doesn't mean there are many gods. And God is God is speaking here. God, Lord God said. So that means uh, God is saying that you know man has become like you angel 
even angels know what's good and evil. Um, so, and also angels are, uh, you know, they live forever, like like God in a way. So they're they're part of God. So or messengers, they can be messengers of God. Um, so when God said, when, you know, become as one of us, it might be also inclusive of angels, and he's talking uh, in, uh, with, with the angels, so to say. Yeah, I don't. Uh, I don't see any reason why it could not be taken that way. I, I lean towards the first interpretation that it's a uh, conversation within the Trinity. Uh, but I, you know, that's just my preference. I, I can't prove it one way or the other. Uh, brother Stevens with us now. Hello, brother. Oh, hello, um, brother Luke. Sorry, I'm not quite ready to talk yet. Just give a couple of minutes, please. All right. Uh, just to where we'll continue on, and, and then you just uh, turn your mic off uh, on when you're ready to talk, okay? All right. Uh, let's go on to the next verse. We're on Genesis uh, 3. Now we're on verse uh, 23. Oh, wait a second. We, for, we, for, we neglected part of 22. It says, um, and now lest he put forth his hand and take also the tree of life, eat and live forever. So this tree of life means that he's going to live forever. And so uh, God doesn't want him to have access to that now. Uh, he doesn't want him to. Uh, and that's why verse 23 he explains, Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the garden uh, of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword, which turneth, turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. The last part of what I think of uh, verse 22, you know, where, where he, you know, he, he, he puts him away from the, from the tree of life. To me, that, that speaks of, you know, because God is obviously holy and perfect, and he desires eventually that, that man will become the same. And obviously, you know, the, the scriptures hadn't been fulfilled. Christ's seed hadn't been, you know, come forth. So if they would have took, imagine the sorry, they would have took forth, the, took forth and, and got hold of the tree, you know, the, the, you know of life, then they would have lived forever in a sinful state, which had been so counterproductive and so grotesque that, that it was actually a blessing again that God took that tree away from them, waiting for a time when the perfect one, which is Jesus Christ, would become that tree of life, and He would take away the sins of the world, being perfect, and cast them into hell where they you know, they deserve. So yeah, I think it could be a, a blessing in disguise there. Yeah, it's, it's like the example you gave earlier. I forgot what it was now, but it was like a... Um, I, don't, I don't remember what verse it was or what your point was, but it's the same kind of a thing where uh, you think, well, if he had let him live forever, he you know, we would have continued living in this uh, state where we're separated from God because of sin. And so, so it's, it's better to, to die, to be mortal, and, and then, but but have the opportunity to receive eternal life in the resurrection, uh, and, and at that point in the resurrection, we we won't have this uh, this condition that we have now, where sin is our nature. Uh, okay, what about the point about uh, not only casting them out but guarding guarding it so they can't get back in with uh, cherubims? Well, that, again, that shows the point of how essential that was, doesn't it? 
that, that, that they had to stop them under all circumstances from, from, from you know, reaching out to the tree of life again. Because if they'd done so, that then, as you made the clear point, that they, yeah, they would live forever, but there would have been no, no relationship with God again, because God can't, you know, bear the presence of sin, and that's why they had to wait for Christ, and that's why God made sure He had the fiery, you know, the angels there to make sure they don't come in. It was that important. Yeah. Okay. Uh, if, unless anybody has something else to say about the, these verses, uh, we'll conclude here. Uh, and we're going to pick up next time uh, Genesis 4 1, and we'll be talking about what things happened, uh, you know, after the fall, the conceiving of Cain and Abel, and so on. And then we'll even go into some verses in the New Testament that reference Adam and Eve. And then, so next week we should be able to conclude this study of Adam and Eve. But for now, let's, let's make sure we end our show as we always do, uh, talking about the most important theological topic that is, there is. Uh, I, I think every one of us has a, um, a calling to tell people the good news about salvation. The gospel means literally good news. And uh, so we don't want someone to watch this and just learn all this history, because this is history. Some people will deny it. They don't think that the Genesis account of creation and Adam and Eve is, is real. They think it's a fable. Even the Pope recently came out and said it's a fable. But uh, we all agree that this is uh, factual. It's history, uh, but no, it does us no good to, to learn about this history and just know what happened. Now we need to know, okay, man fell, there's a problem, and now he's going to die. We haven't heard about hell yet, but he's going to die, and then he's got the lake of fire and the second death. That's what man has to look forward to. But uh, fortunately, God loves us so much, he provided a, a solution. Just as Adam and Eve couldn't solve the problem by sewing fig leaves together and covering themselves, God had to provide the covering that was satisfactory. And so let's tell anybody who's watching this now uh, what kind of solution God gave mankind so that, so that we don't have to die and then suffer the second death in the lake of fire. Instead, we can have eternal life in the kingdom of God. Uh, whoever wants to speak on that, go ahead. Well, I'll, I shall speak on that if that's okay. Yeah, and I, and I will just implore because that's that's the you know the evangelist heart of me now that that the, you would cast aside you know the first Adam, which is death, and you would you know place upon yourself this day the the second Adam, which is Jesus Christ, in whom everlasting life is found. You know, we, if you've listened to the study, you know, this evening and the studies before, you know, sin and death entered in. But as we go further on into the scriptures, we can see that, that there was reconciliation, there was redemption, and there is one who is Jesus Christ who defeated sin, death, and hell. And I implore you today, you know, if, if you know if you know in your heart that you can't make it on yourself and you know like all the rest of us, you know, that you're just you know, you're human, you were and you sin and you're not perfect, that, that you would call upon this Jesus Christ. That you know that, that he, he loves you so dearly, and even from the very beginning of the fall, when man fell, he has planned an escape, and he's planned a way for you back home to have a relationship with him. So I pray that you call upon his cross and died for all your sins, because he loved you. And because he was buried, and he rose again the third day, proving that he had power over life and death. And you used to put your trust in him and those facts, you will be as promised. You will be raised from the dead, and you'll be your this this corruptible, this old Adam will be gone, and you'll be placed upon you the incorruptible, which is the new Adam. You'll be clothed in the righteousness of Christ, and you will live forevermore. That is the heart of the gospel, and that is the good news. And I'd even say the best news in the whole world. So and pray Christ, you know, embrace Christ now. Call upon him this day and be ever saved and ever loved. That's my call today. Mm -hmm. 
and we all say amen. Uh, uh, that's that's all true. That's exactly what a person needs to hear and understand and believe. Uh, and yet, I'm th thinking as maybe someone in the audience may be thinking, and maybe they have some follow-up questions. So uh, I, I, I'd like to follow up with a couple of questions. Uh, uh, Bill or, or anybody else, uh, is it uh, this this Jesus that you're referring to? Uh, you know, who is he? Is is he is he uh, a good man? That's an example for us to try to live like him. Is he a prophet? Just as as uh, Muslims teach that he's a great prophet. Uh, is he a great moral teacher? Is an example for us. Uh, who exactly is this Jesus that you're asking me to believe in? And if you want me to answer that, the answer, straight answer to that is, is that is that Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh. He is God. Only God has the power to forgive sins and only God has the power to create, to bring to life or not. So that's why it's so important you trust in Jesus Christ, because he is God manifest in the flesh. Okay. So Jesus is actually God. And you're you're saying that he is the eternal God Almighty. He does he was not ever created. He he has no beginning or end. Yep, that's that's the very God. That is Jesus Christ. Yep. And uh and so he became a man, and you say that he died on a cross. Uh, well, uh, and 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 people have to believe in him to have eternal life. Well, what about the people who don't believe in him, who uh, are, are members of all the different religions of the world? You know, uh, how about the Muslims and the the Buddhists and the Mormons and everybody else who believe differently, and. Uh, I mean, if they're good, and they're atheists. The, the Pope even said that atheists, if they do good works and do good deeds and give to charity and stuff like that, that even they can go to heaven. Yeah, well, the Word of God says entirely different. You know, the Word says that, you know, neither is there salvation than any other, for there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Not could be saved, but must be saved. And that name is Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ himself even says, you know, that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man come up unto the Father but by me. So though it's totally open and inclusive of every single creature, it is exclusive that is only found in Jesus Christ because he is God manifest in the flesh. He's not a God small g, but he's a God big g, the creator of all things. So um, Jesus is the only way, but uh, what, what about uh, a, a person that, that lives a good life and, you know, let's say they do go to, go to church and they, they do all kinds of good things. I mean, won't, won't God consider their life about, you know, well, they did some bad things, but their good things outweighed their bad things. Won't, won't that be satisfied, God? No, no, again, because the word says that, that all our righteousnesses, all the good things we do, under this holy and perfect God, are as filthy rags. They'll avail nothing. There's only one work that, that, that pleases the Father, and that is Christ. And if you believe on Christ, that is the only work, and actually the very will of the Father himself. In him alone, you know, is he satisfied. You know, we can do nothing. The word even says, you know, therefore by the deeds of the law, there shall be no flesh justified in his sight. For by, the law, you know, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. So being good, keeping the commandments, doing all these things, which are not wrong in themselves, that they avail nothing, because they're, 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 they're filthy rags unto God. Only what Christ has done, and what Christ completed at Calvary, is acceptable to our God. So it sounds like uh, what you're saying is that uh, if a person is religious, they let's say they join a religion, let's say they join various religions, and they become the most religious person in the world and perform all the religious acts required of that religion, 
uh, that still will be unsatisfactory, and that, that is, it will not satisfy God so they can have eternal life. And so you're not asking people to join a religion and become a religious person. That instead, what are you asking them to do? All I'm asking people again is, is forget religion because it will kill you dead. Religion is what man has always done to try and reach to God. Rather, we need to accept God, what he has done for us, and reach down to man. We need to accept and embrace what, what Christ offers, which is relationship, not religion. That is the only thing that is satisfiable, that is God's desire in this matter. And to be honest, it's the only hope that, that mankind has got. And I pray that anyone watching this now would, would embrace this. You know, chuck religion in the bin, but embrace relationship with Christ Jesus today. Mm -hmm. All right. It sounds to me then, from everything you've said, well, what the Bible is really asking everybody to do is uh, don't, do not put your faith in religions. Do not put your faith in yourself, in your ability to somehow live a good life and God satisfied. Don't put any faith in that. Instead, put all your faith in Jesus because he is eternal God Almighty, and he died for our sins, so now sins are paid for. And the reason that we should be able to trust him is because he raised himself from the dead, and that proves that he's God and that he does have this power of life everlasting. So, uh, viewing audience, it's really that simple. We're just asking you to believe on Jesus for your salvation, no longer believing in yourself. Don't believe in your own ability to get to heaven. Reject that. Understand and say, I, I, I surrender. I'm defeated. I, I know I can't get there through religion. I need Jesus to be my Savior. I'm going to depend on him completely. I hope that's what you've got if you've been watching this. I hope, hope that, that is your understanding a conclusion here. All right, I'm going to ask uh, the, the, the panelists to say goodbye individually, however you'd like to say, and then, and then we will uh, end the live broadcast. Uh, Brother Sam? Hi, uh, yes, I kind of stepped out a little bit. My, my folks are visiting out of town, and they brought a whole bunch of stuff, so obviously you know, I had to help them. Um, yeah, I, uh, I think that uh, this lesson is great because it's, touches on very basic and fundamental uh, aspect and that is how we can keep ourselves away from temptation and and therefore uh, you know we don't have to spend or waste that much of time doubting the Word of God or um, getting into any sort of confusion because that sort of things are nothing but you know it's not going to edify anyone, first of all. And secondly, it's just going to deter your faith. And and um, you might even get lost if you keep on, if, if you keep at it. So uh, I think we need to keep the Word of God very close and check it and recheck it and see if it is, if any word, any word that people are saying is actually of God. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, we really have to rely on the Holy Spirit so that He can guide us to all truth and grow basically the discernment that is quite needed, uh, especially these days during the, the last days. And, you know, um, it, it is very important for us to wake, to be awake always. And um, if. Um, if anywhere, anywhere that we need to be, we, we would be tempted, then we uh, always uh, go back to the Word of God, and that um, we can basically you know, keep all the fiery darts away with our uh, shield of faith. And I think that's one of the ways that we can become perfect in Christ. And also, just mem remember that. Uh, Blaming and accu uh, accusing, especially blaming God for what you know what you've done, 
and it's quite idiotic. You know, I hear a lot of people saying that oh, because of this group of people, or because of you, whatever. Uh, and, you know, I don't believe because of whatever, and that sort of blame game will not work before God. Um, just come clean, naked. Um, you know, don't be hiding. Uh, God knows already, so just uh, simply ask, and uh, it'll be all good. Uh, you know, so believe in Christ and live everlasting life. God bless you. Thank you. All right, thank you, Brother Sam. Thanks for participating. Uh, is Jackson still there? Okay. Uh, Joanne, do you have any closing remarks? Uh, yeah, I um, just want to bring up um, something that uh, actually convicted me um, when I first became a Christian. And um, I remember a fellow brother, elder, that said to me, you know, I had a problem um, getting a grip with sin and what sin was. And um, my pride was getting in the way of humbling myself before Christ. And um, he literally said to me, you know, have you ever lied? And I said, yes. He said, well, that makes you a liar. And um, then he said to me, have you ever stolen? You know, and I was sort of, oh. And he said, even as a child, have you ever stolen a thimble, a, a cent, you know, a pen from a classmate? And I said, yes. And he said, well, that makes you a thief. He said, that's, that's a sin before God. And um, it really got to me. It really, really got to me, you know. And, um, and then he went on to, uh, to tell me about uh, Jesus being the perfect sacrifice, you know, for our, the atonement of our sins. And, um, and he was explaining to me about how back in the Old Testament, um, where there would be sacrifice of animals for the atonement, um, blood sacrifices for the atonement of sins, you know, and um, and then, you know, because we all fall short of the glory of God, and we can never reach that benchmark, um, whether we've murdered, whether we've stolen, whether we've lied, whatever it may be, um, and um, you know, and by Jesus. Uh, dying on that cross, he was the perfect sacrifice, the, the blood sacrifice for, for the atonement of our sins. And I, and to this day, I visually see, you know, Christ on that cross taking my sins and, um, you know, the blood that was spilt on my behalf, let alone for the world. And, um, I just want to say to people that it's really easy. Call out to God and humble yourself before Jesus Christ, you know, and ask him, ask him for forgiveness, ask him to come into your life and have faith in what he's done for you. You know, he's died on that cross for you. You know, it's it's so liberating and awesome being a Christian. You don't have to carry that burden. You walk a different you walk a different way or a walk within Christ. You're not perfect, but you walk a different walk. The Holy Spirit is forever going before you. You know, and and convicting you and, and teaching you and showing you what God wants from you. And it's not hard. It's not hard. You know, I remember um, there used to be a car sticker out, you know, um, and um, it was uh, something along the lines of uh, Christians are not perfect, they're just forgiven. And it's so true. If you come to Christ and you humble yourself before him and believe in him, you know, 
It's God's perfect gift, grace. All you've got to do is take it and accept it and believe in Jesus Christ. It's not anything huge. It is huge, but it's not it's not a burden. It's not a burden and it's not a yoke around your neck. It's very liberating and very free and very you you have a promise from Christ from God of eternal life. I mean there is nothing more that you know that you could possibly want at the end of the day because we all fall short of that glory without him. And I just hey. All right, thank you, sister. Uh, well said, and uh, I, I want to thank all the panelists for participating. I hope you're all able to join me again next week. We should be able to conclude the study on Adam and Eve next week, and then I've got a, a fascinating topic in, in mind for the future, but I'll divulge that later. Uh, all right, uh, if, you're, if you're, you're the viewing audience, uh, please put your faith completely in Jesus receive the gift of eternal life, it's free, and if you do that, make a comment, let us know. Bless you all and rest in the love and grace of our great Savior God, his name is Jesus Christ.